All right, Diane, we're, All right. we're ready to get going whenever you guys are. All right, I'm going to start a little bit of um, introductions. I'm Diane Hernandez. I pronouns are she, her. We've met before in the last three sessions. Um, we are in the, the last of my sessions. We've got another session next week that you guys should be super excited about which is um, on March 3rd, same time, same bat channel. Uh, the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa is gonna do a round table with people with the lived experience of working after brain injury. Um, so definitely uh, get into that, like push your button, put it on your calendar, you guys should show up. Um, we are going to ask people again to mute themselves. So if everybody can make sure they're muted, that's terribly helpful. Um, all materials regarding this, uh, these sessions, uh, should have been emailed out to you. If you can't find them, check your spam folder. That's where mine landed. Um, and they've also been uploaded to the YouTube channel. So you can check them out there. I also went ahead and put into the chat. So we've, I've given you guys a lot of different tools and all that. It's in all the different presentations. But what I did was I kind of went through all of the presentations and put together something so that I could like just put it in the chat. So if you guys check out the chat, that's just all the links. we. I believe it's all the links that we've talked about. Um, just a nice little recap of all the resources that we've had over our time together. Um, and now I am going to turn the presentation over to Roxanne Kogel from the Epilepsy Foundation um, to talk about the specific things that happen in regard to work and people who experience both brain injury and epilepsy or epilepsy because of brain injury. So All go right. Roxanne. Thank you, Diane. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Is that loud enough? Yes. Yeah, you're All good right. now. So I just put in the chat box, the link of traumatic brain injury and epilepsy a website. So my name is Roxanne Kogel. I'm executive director of the Epilepsy Foundation of Iowa. I've been in this role for 10 years, helping individuals and families navigate resources and doing a lot of education programs throughout the state and helping professionals that work directly with people with epilepsy. And we get quite a few calls because whether if somebody is helping them with employment or transportation or for community type services, when somebody has uncontrolled seizures, it certainly throws a wrench into things. So, um, so for about 10 to 15 minutes here, I'm going to talk about the intersection of brain injury and epilepsy, and then provide some tips and resources for employment. And so Epilepsy.com is the number one website in the world to get information on epilepsy. It's authored by medical professionals and it's authored by the Epilepsy Foundation of America. So just know this is a reputable, incredible website to get information. So I'm going to walk you through again, the link is in the chat box and for traumatic brain injury and epilepsy. So it's TBI is a common cause of seizures and epilepsy. And, um, and, and many times people know when somebody su suffers a traumatic brain injury, they land in the hospital, they often are discharged with uh, anti-seizure medication as a preventative measure because they're at high risk for having seizures. And so when we look at how common TBI is with epilepsy, so when we look at data from the CDC, um, there's 2.87 million emergency room visits, hospitalizations um, that occur um, in, in a year, according to in the year 2014. And so it, it's a lot more common than what people realize. And sometimes this, when people have seizures, they are mild, other times they're moderate, other times they're severe. Sometimes the seizures can start right away after a brain injury and other times they can start months uh, or years later from that damaged scar tissue in the brain. And so this website has a lot of great resources for, for TBI and, and, and epilepsy. And so 
uh, when we look at early seizures that occur after a traumatic brain injury, um, one in 10 people will experience an early seizure after a TBI. And 50% of, of early seizures occur within the first 24 hours following a TBI. And many times they end up being the generalized tonic-clonic seizures. And what this means is seizures that originate from both sides of the brain. Tonic means stiff and clonic means jerk. So these are the jerking and shaking motions, the convulsive type seizures, the kind that are, that can be pretty scary to, to witness. About one in 10 people will develop status epilepticus in the early period after a TBI. And what status epilepticus, how that is medically defined is a lengthy seizure that goes on and on and does not end on its own or somebody having clusters of seizures, repetitive seizures without returning to baseline. And it used to be medically defined at 30 minutes, but now the medical community has redefined this at five minutes. So if somebody is having a lengthy seizure and it hits the five minute mark and it does not end on its own before the five minute mark, many physicians consider that status epilepticus and they may need rescue medication or an IV bolus or something uh, type of treatment to help stop that lengthy seizure or repetitive clust clusters of seizures that last for five minutes. And so that's just a good rule of thumb. And most seizures will run through its course and, and on its own in one to three minutes in just a few minutes. And that's why the physicians use the five minute mark because it's lasting longer than what it typically would last. And it should have ended already. And so, Late seizures that in, in late seizures are defined as seizures occurring more than a week after a TBI. And many times this occurs when it's been a more serious brain injury and it could lead to the complication of post-traumatic epilepsy or PTE. So some of you have probably heard of post-traumatic epilepsy. And what this means is somebody that is at risk for reoccurrent seizures as a result of the brain injury. And so the statistics is one in 50 will have a traumatic brain injury that will go on to develop a post-traumatic epilepsy. And the spectrum of severity, um, it, it varies from where the seizures are well controlled to resistant to treatment, which is considered uncontrolled or refractory to treatment. So when we look at types of seizures that people have with post-traumatic epilepsy, it's about eight out of 10 people will have focal seizures. And these are seizures that occur or originate in a specific focal area of the brain. The rest of the brain is completely unaffected during that seizure. And part of the reason why the statistic is high for focal seizures is because what we find is that damaged tissue in the brain where that traumatic brain injury occurred, you can usually you know, see it on imaging, but that's the area of the brain that is where those seizures originate from is in a, in a, in that focal area, damaged area of the brain. Here's a really good diagram of focal seizures versus generalized seizures. So generalized seizures means the seizures uh, activity is occurring on both sides of the brain. And focal means it's a specific focal area of the brain. And the reason why it's important for physicians and neurologists to help identify what kind of seizure is because uh, anti-seizure medication is the frontline treatment. That's the treatment we have the most data for helping manage seizures. And some medications are FDA approved for managing focal seizures. Other medications are only FDA approved for managing generalized seizures. And if somebody has both kinds of seizures or both types, that could be why they're on more than one kind of epilepsy or seizure medication. So a person is at higher risk for developing post-traumatic epilepsy if they experience early seizures after a traumatic brain injury, if they had bleeding into the brain tissue or bruising at the time of injury, or perhaps if they suffered a skull fracture or um, something uh, penetrating the brain trauma, such as a bullet or a combat injury, or they have a head injury that has occurred in relation to alcohol use or surgery needed to remove bleeding, such as a hematoma from the brain or to remove a foreign object to the brain or to drain fluid of ventricular of the brain. So 
uh, or if the EEG has abnormalities, which occur early in the post-injury. So an EEG is where they put electrodes on top of the brain and it monitors the brain waves. And this is really important data for physicians to see because they want to see what that brain wave activity is doing. And if somebody has is displaying symptoms or episodes or what they think is seizure activity, and they have those electrodes on the head, the majority of the time, the neurologist can tell by looking at the EEG brainwave data, if it's epileptic seizure activity or not. And so that is very helpful data. A person is also at higher risk if they're older, or if they have a family history of epilepsy. And so this website just continues to go on with diagrams, um, looking at risk factors, changes in the brain that can cause seizures after a TBI, um, how seizures are treated. If somebody has failed two or three seizure medications, then most local neurology clinics uh, re tend to refer to a certified level four epilepsy center. And we only have one certified level four epilepsy center in the state of Iowa, and that's the University of Iowa. At a certified level four epilepsy center, there's a team of epileptologists. Those are neurologists who are board certified in epilepsy. They have epilepsy neurosurgeons. They have epilepsy nurses. They have a lot more testing equipment and treatment options uh, that they can do. And then they can help determine to see if that person is a candidate for other treatment options if the medications do not work. Uh, there's also deep brain stimulation is now FDA approved for managing epileptic seizures, as well as RNS stimulation, the VNS stimulation with the vagus nerve stimulator. There's also a lot of great research for dietary therapy regimens under physician directed care, such as the rigorous ketogenic diet, modified Atkins diet, and the low glycemic diet. We see the modified Atkins diet uh, used more often than the other two diets in the adult population to help with seizure management. Um, surgical treatment, uh, comorbidities. Uh, there's just a lot of things, as we know, with people that suffer brain injuries, um, severe brain injuries that it can impact. And, and seizures, unfortunately, just add another complexity to that, to that issue. So the good thing is about 25 to 40% of people will have remission or no seizure symptoms of their epilepsy with initial treatment, meaning that initial treatment of that medication does a pretty good job of managing those seizures. And then they can, and which is, which is a huge help where we get into challenging situations is those situations where the medications don't work and it, and people are having frequent and uncontrolled seizures. So now I'm going to switch screens here. Um, now that I've talked a lot about brain injury and epilepsy, and I am going to, I have a few slides here on employment that I would like to show. So when we look at epilepsy with the American for Disabilities Act, um, so the ADA does not contain a list of medical conditions for disabilities and said, you know, as we all know, as you, many of you probably know, the ADA has a general definition that a person must meet on a case by case basis. So we have a lot of people with epileptic seizures that are not, their seizures are managed. It does not impact their quality of life. They have full high functioning careers. And so they do not meet that definition. And there's other people with epileptic seizures that have comorbidities or a, a, you know, a severe brain injury, for example, that where it, they do meet the definition uh, with the American for Disabilities Act with, with their epilepsy, especially if the seizures are uncontrolled. And so we get a lot of calls on employment, supporting people with epilepsy in the workplace. And so sometimes people think because they have epilepsy, they can't work at all. Well, that's a false statement. People with epilepsy can make positive contributions in the workplace and they can work even if they have uncontrolled seizures. It's something that they need to have a conversation with their physician. They may need accommodations um, in order for them to execute their job duties. And it could be more challenging. And many times it is more challenging trying to find, help somebody find a job, but it's not impossible. And so we're also battling the stigma and the discrimination uh, with epilepsy as well. 
And so we get a lot of questions on, especially when people have uncontrolled epilepsy as accommodations. And this is a, just a wonderful resource, the Job Accommodation Network. They have different medical conditions and they have a series on employees with epilepsy. And you can go to askjan.org and then type in the medical condition and it'll pull it up. And it'll list several different types of accommodations And so what I do is I have people look through there, they discuss it with their physician, they may come across two or three or one or something that may be helpful for them for their physician to write, you know, an accommodation for, for their employer. So this is a very helpful, helpful resource. We also utilize a lot Disability Rights Iowa can help counsel and and guide people with employment accommodations as it relates to different medical conditions as well. Um, we, we do have a lot of resources for employment and we're happy to be here and, and be a resource, especially when you're working with consumers in, in challenging situations. So Diane, I think I hit my 15 minutes. (laughs) It was a lot of information, but hopefully I hit on some of the key points you were hoping to, to cover with this group. Yeah, for sure. Does anybody have any questions for Roxanne? All right. I think that you're good. Um, her, the website that she pointed out is in the chat. Um, also want to remind you, I made a list of other resources that we've talked about during these, this series, and I put all of those in the chat as well. So, all right. Get out of your car and go do whatever you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Diane. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. So, like I said, we put a bunch of stuff in the chat box. Hold on a second. I think that's her getting out of her car. (laughs) Maybe not. Um, All right, there we go. All right. So we're going to uh, work on this last session. Again, I highly encourage everyone to go to the session uh, next week because that's going to be people with the lived experience. So that is very important. Um, I um, wanted to, I'm going to go back. Um, So we ended last session um, with some questions that were pretty heavy questions for the last two minutes of, of session. Um, which had to do with uh, accountability. And I just wanted to let everybody know, I have had had an interesting two weeks since that last lesson. Um, I uh, was, was thinking about it and I was thinking about how I felt like it was a vocabulary issue, that I was saying the same thing that other people were saying, that the vocabulary was messing us up. Um, and I went to a session, a DEI, a disability uh, equity and inclusion seminar, where oddly enough, that subject matter came up and people said that literally what came up in the class was white people see uh, uh, accountability as ownership of process, which is truly what I meant. Um, And and this was particularly about, um, it was about African-Americans and they said, and black people see it as acceptance of guilt and there's a punitive process in it. Um, I did not mean the latter. Um, I meant the former. Um, I then went home and talked to my 22 year old who sets me straight on all things. Um, And she also said that same thing. Anyway, I did a big deep dive and basically I think it was that I was using, um, my vocabulary was archaic. So I'm going to go through it again today. So then I went on. So as I was thinking about all those things and trying to process how maybe the words that I was ha- was using were throwing people off, um, I came across this on Nora Neff Hardy's Facebook page um, for the bra- working with brain injury yoga for working with brain injury or something like that. I don't know what it was called. Um, and um, I thought it was kind of 
apropos for the situation. So forgive yourself for knowing what you did not know before you learned it. Um, I've learned my lesson. I'm just basically not going to use those particular words again. Um, and, uh, and hopefully be able to get my message about out more clearly. Um, that kind of made me laugh because it meant that I learned something. Life taught me a lesson over the last two weeks. And, um, what, and so life teaching me that lesson, one of the things I was going to talk about it kind of in, in terms of that same conversation, um, is what a great teacher life is. So this is saying you guys have probably already always heard is that life's a great teacher. When you don't learn a lesson, it will repeat it. That is true. However, I also want to say life is such a great teacher that sometimes that emotional memory will kick in and you're going to remember it forever, whether or not you have a brain injury or not. Um, and that's kind of what I meant by you're not going to create any kind of consequence for your folks necessarily. You're going to be trying to support them um, in their employment goal. But a natural consequences are going to come along. And sometimes those natural consequences are just literally the only way to learn that lesson. Um, and part of that has to do with the way that our brain works, right? So remember when we talked about the grapefruit and how we file things away in our cerebral cortex, that's where most of our memory is. And, but then when we have an emotional memory, that's going to dig down deep. That We're going to find that in that um, like lizard brain way deep, down deep inside. Um that's how emotional memory works. So people can remember, even the people who don't have very good, what we traditionally think of as long-term or short-term memories can still emotionally remember something so that that action doesn't ever happen again. And I, I have not found a way that that happens other than life. So I'm going to give you guys two examples that are kind of similar. Years ago, long, 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 long time ago, um, I started working with a guy who um, was very inappropriate, said really inappropriate things um, a lot of the time. Um, and um, when he had a job, we worked on it, we worked on it, worked on it. It seemed like it was better. He was ready. He was, you know, work ready, went to work, got a really good job at uh, working in the tire department of a Walmart. But he um, made a very inappropriate comment to a, um, oh, shoot, that's not going to work. Um, he made a very inappropriate comment to a coworker, um, a little 19 year old girl who worked at the um, subway shop that was there in Walmart. And I mean, there, there's no getting around it. It was a very inappropriate proposition y kind of comment. And he got fired. Um, from what we've learned about brain injury, right? You would say, well, he, he's never, I mean, he's got an impulse control problem. That's going to be a problem forever. He doesn't use appropriate words. No matter, and I assure you that I had talked to him about these beforehand. Um, but that, I mean, that's just not the case. He, when he got fired for making that inappropriate comment, he has then never done that again. Um, he went to go work in a different, in a warehouse environment, but a warehouse environment where there were plenty of people who he might want to, I mean, if he, if he really couldn't control himself, he would have made the same comment too. Um, and I, like, it's just never been a problem again. He learned the lesson that time. And so I, I guess that's just to say, if you find yourself job developing for somebody and something goes wrong, trust, trust, trust life, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Similarly, Bob Brain had not altogether the same situation, but made an inappropriate comment, you know, like literally his first day at work. Um, questionable as far as whether or not it was the same level of not a great comment um, as the other guy. But he got written up the very first day. Um, and again, based on his impulse control issues, there would be reason to believe that he wasn't going to keep doing it. Um, we really had to work through the fact that he kept saying, now I feel super uncomfortable in my work environment because I'm afraid that I'm going to say something wrong. And we had to talk about like, when you're working in a new environment where there's new expectations, you're always going to feel uncomfortable. 
but that was okay. And worked through it. And he did work through it. He hasn't made any more inappropriate com- uh, comments at his job. And that was incredibly helpful when we got to, if you guys remember the chocolate syrup incident, because they were like, well, I mean, it was, it was hard for them to see, like he had this one big outburst at work. Um, it was hard for the management to be able to visualize that he was never going to do that again. And I was like, no, you know, like he learns from mistakes. And if that weren't true, he would still be making inappropriate comments. And he's not. So that shows that he can learn. And sure enough, he's never made more any more inappropriate contact comments. And honestly, we're, sh- we're seeing great, great uh improvement in him as far as being able to manage his anxiety, manage his frustrations at work. Uh, we're still doing the offsite uh, work on that. So we made, I, you guys, I don't know if you guys can see me, but we made these bracelets this week. Um, it was very frustrating. And, you know, he's really learning how to calm down and know when it's time to take a break or ask for help. Um, And you can learn those lessons, but sometimes it really does take having some sort of emotional memory to tell you not to do those things. Um, Back to the guy who was at um, Walmart. I got a text from him this week because he knew that I was doing these presentations. He said, Diane, I would like to say, live your life. Do not let your brain injury make a new life for you. Carry on doing your usual and bring your brain injury along for the ride. Yesterday, my favorite coworker, Joel, I was working down the aisle and I scanned a part that belonged right beside him and we were conversing and I forgot something. And I said, that's a symptom of me being mentally disabled. And my favorite coworker responded, I don't believe you're handicapped. I believe you're handicapable. And it made me subtly proud and um, internally laugh. And I'm sharing that little story with you guys. This is, um, this is somebody who people did never think was going to be able to be employable because of his actions. And he is a model employee at this point. It just took some time. Um, so the brain injury, the bottom line, brain injury bottom line is that it is true. Like I've, I've used this quote before from Maya Angelou. This is the Maya Angelou lesson because we're bringing her up twice in one, one class. Um, that people will forget what you said and they're going to forget how, what you did, but they're never going to forget how you made your, them feel. So every interaction is a chance to be safe, heard, understood, respected, celebrated, hopeful, secure, and empowered. Um, and anything that I said before, it was supposed, this is what it means. It also means making people feel like they're adults uh, because sometimes we can have a tendency to start talking down to people. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves to talk to people like people, like grownups. Um, and this is just another picture I liked showing how I talked to Bob brain this week and said, what are some things that help you get through? Um, and he said, having somebody who reminds me who I was before um, and knowing there's somebody there to support me. Um, a lot of times just reminding people of the skills that they are, that they had, and they still can tap into, um, based on their lived experience. And I'm going to go into another little thing about that, the lived experience before their brain injury, but there's also parts of their lived experience as a person with a brain injury that are important to remind people about, right? So Um, I had somebody contact me a couple of weeks ago about somebody who wanted to go into education and um, the provider was worried that they weren't going to be able to to do what the person thought they were going to be able to do. And uh, it was a funder and and there was just a bunch of questions. Um, And what I like to remind people of when you're working with people with brain injury is not everybody. I mean, not everybody went fully into the hospital and went fully into like acute rehab. But a lot did. And a lot of people that I work with did. And what you find is you've got somebody who went into the hospital and somebody told them or their family, told their family probably, um, that they were never going to be able to breathe again on their own. And they did it. Um, They were never going to be able to eat or walk again on their own. And they did it. 
Um, so at the point that someone with a brain injury says, I'm going to do this next thing. If you want to be the person that tells that brain injured person that they are not going to be able to do what they think they can do, um, good, good luck because they've been told they weren't going to be able to do a lot of things. And if they're with you talking about going back to work, they've made it pretty darn far. Um, and even if they still are having trouble, even if they're still didn't accomplish all of these things, they accomplished a lot. So every person that you work with who has a brain injury, just keep in mind what an incredible survivor person you've got in front of you and tap into the fact that you know for sure that you are working with a resilient human being. Which is basically to say, I say all the time, my crystal ball is not grand. It is terrible. Um, and so I don't try to guess. The person should lead the process. Um, trust them and what they say that they can or cannot do. Work with the family. Um, believe in them. Maybe just one iota more than they believe in themselves at least, um, which will move you forward. Um, these are so, so we've been talking about how sometimes people are going to be hit by real life consequences of things that they may or may not have been able to, con to control. And so I wanted to go through some thoughts about how to help them through those experiences. Um, one is you don't want to perpetuate denial. So you want to model acceptance. It is what it is. Like not it is what it is in a dismissive way. But in a, there's no, you, you've got to be able to recreate the situation for them. Uh, so we'll go back to Bob Brain. Um, because of your brain injury, you have a frustration pro tolerance problem that resulted in this thing happening. It puts your job at risk, but we're going to put these things in place to try to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And then that's, that's not a, there's no, there's no blame. There's no shame. There's no, there, like, you've got to be able to just say, this is what the situation is and help them accept that as it is. Um, and then let them miss their own reality. If somebody says, but I used to be able to do this, or um, I used to be a big deal, or I used to run a whole department, or I used to do this, really the only answer for that is I hear you and that has to be hard. Um, anything where you say, but look at what all you, like it doesn't, like let them sit in that. That is hard and they need a minute to sit in that and just for to acknowledge, to be acknowledged and to be heard into the fact that their lived experience changed overnight and they need support in that. And then make some space and then engage them in the solution. So once you've made that space, once the, you feel like the person's ready to move forward out of that difficult situation, make some space for them and let them engage in the solution. So one way that you can do that um, a good way to start that conversation. If somebody's struggling either with a coworker or management or with their own barriers, um, a, a good way of approaching the conversation is to say, do you want me to work through work? Th do you want to work through how to work within the current system? In other words, do you want me to be able to tell you what to do to work with the way things are now, or do you want to work through how to advocate for change within the system? Um, that just kind of opens that conversation up to the full range of possibilities um, and gives them a chance to start thinking about how they want to do things. Um, I'm going to give you guys a little secret. Those last two slides I did not get from any disability work I've ever done or any brain injury work I ever done. My husband... Um, is a dean at a college and he works with professors and he's the one who gave me this, um, these ideas, which is just to go to show whether or not you're working with um, people who have their doctorate and are who are teaching college or you're working with people with brain injury, um, people are people and a lot of those same skills are going to apply when you're working with them. Um, this, this session, I'm mostly saying the things that go on in my head that help me um, do this work. Um, so I put up this picture for you guys. Um, I'm going to let y'all guess how, where I grew up. Um, so we're just going to go with when, 
when Diane was knee high to a grasshopper, this is where she was. It took me a really long time to figure out what I was good at and what I was not good at. Um, turned out I wasn't really good at sports that involved a ball. If people throw things at me, I'm probably going to duck. Um, but I was good at swimming. I was good at writing. Um, I was good at a lot of things. And I figured those things out over time. The people that we are working with with brain injury have to start this process all over again to some extent. And it varies from person to person. Um, but learning who you are, whether or not that's the new you trying to get to the new normal or the little tiny Texan that is obviously in these pictures. Um, either way, that is a long and hard process. And thinking of it in this way helps me do the work that I do. Um, I'm sure that a lot of folks came here looking for um, how to work with people with those hardest, the hardest to serve people with brain injury um, because their problems aren't cognitive or physical, but they have a tendency to be more in the lines of, shoot, um, of, they're more in the lines of, hold on, I messed this up. Um, there we go. Um, those emotional regulations, people who, snap, who yell, who, um, who act in a way that is hard for their coworkers, um, and impulsivity, like the two cases that I talked about before. Um, a lot of this is going to be the same stuff that you guys learned, um, in any other class that you've been in about de-escalation. Um, you're going to, you, I'm assuming that anybody's in this in this class is to have enough training that you know to take an individual to a quiet area or um, to use mindfulness techniques to ground. Um, again, you can go back to the Brain Injury Alliance and find those like just very basic things. Um, but it's just kind of a reminder to go back to those basic things. There is not a magic bullet for those very hard to work with cases. It is doing, and again, I would go back to, and it's in the chat about how to get to the book um, about Pearl. Um, but being positive, always positive, being early, um, really making sure that you know what the antecedent is to the behavior. Um, having a positive outlook on the people that you serve, um, doing that all the time with all the people, including the hardest to serve and the easiest to serve, everybody all the time. Um, being reinforcing, looking for opportunities to reinforce, remembering that like, like all those super basic skills, right? Like you want to be able to provide three positive comments before you do anything redirective. Um, and then looking for opportunities to do all those things. Um, I wish there was, it like most things that a lot, are not most, but a lot of the things that we do in life um, that are hard, it's not that they're complicated, they're like super simple and super difficult to instigate. So just making sure that you do that. And that's why I wanted to give you guys some of these things that I tell myself in my head about what the process looks like and how life can be hard. And a setback isn't always, a setback is sometimes just a stumble. It's not something that's going to take you completely off the path. Um, because those are the things that keep me going, right? Like I'm telling you, like, this is why, um, how I reframe my own thinking in order to be able to maintain a the most positive, uplifting outlook that I can for the people that I serve. The other thing that I think about a lot is um, superpowers. And the reason why I think we sometimes we'll say we need to work with that person that, and find their superpower, right? For the person who has um, deficits. But I'm going to see if I can't, so we've got, see if I can figure out who it is that I'm hearing. Um, but one of the things that I always think about superpowers is that almost every, um, almost every one of the superheroes has some kind of something went wrong, right? Like uh, Batman, it's mostly that he had PTSD. Honestly, um, Spider-Man got hit by a hit 
by a, bit by a spider. Um, Iron Man wouldn't even be alive if it weren't for the fact that he has that thing in his chest. Um, it's the thing that makes the person that gives the person that makes the person's life harder that can make them have a superpower. And so when you're talking to the people that you're serving, go back and do go back and talk about, dude, you are somebody who had a major accident. You learned how to walk. You learned how to talk. You're still showing compassion to your kids. Um, I can go through the people that I'm serving right now. And I can be like, one is tender. One's tenacious. There's, something really amazing about each person I'm serving and some of that they had innately before their brain injury and some of them that they have because of it. Um, and so try to think about what is it that is causing this person, like this person has something that went wrong and somehow that gave them a superpower. And what, what is that? Um, Back to some real basics. Um, when we're working with people with brain injury, it's really important to have those long-term um, supports in place, whether those are the natural supports or whether or not they always know that they can go back to their employment provider in order to get help when they need it. Um, because any kind of change um, is going to be hard. People work really well in what they know. And if you change something up, it can affect how they're doing their job or how they're interacting with the people around them. Um, for instance, we know that Bob the, Bra Bob, Bob the Barista is um, going to have additional responsibilities coming up in March. Um, he is going to have, they're going to start doing a grab and go. It's a hotel. So the, the grab and go breakfast. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're putting things in place that we can be there um, when that change happens and when there's a new task or when there's a new supervisor. And I'm that's true for all people with disabilities. Anybody who's done this work for a while knows that things can change. Well, in all honesty, all people's jobs can change and get bad. You can have a great supervisor and love your job and then something can change and your job isn't working out. But we just want to make sure that we're staying in touch, touching base and asking really good questions. Like, have you had any trouble with your supervisor lately? Um, is there anything at your work that's really, what's the most, what's the best thing about your job right now? What's the worst thing about your job? Because if you just call people and say, how is your job going? They're going to say, fine. Uh, so we want to ask really specific questions when we're doing those kind of long-term follow-up touch-ins, uh, to find out how people are doing. I don't think I covered on this, so I did want to cover on the fact that having substance abuse is is a risk. Having substance substance abuse is a factor um, for having a traumatic brain injury, and then traumatic brain injury is a risk factor for developing a substance abuse problem. So they've looked at it, and seventy two percent of the people who are in dual treatment for substance abuse and severe mental illness have reported a history of at least one TBI. So if you're the people that you're serving, this goes back to what we talked a couple of sessions ago when June was talking about screening. We've got to make sure that we're noticing whether or not the problem might be the brain injury. Um, but then again, I want to say, if you've seen one brain injury, you've seen one brain injury. I know all of these statistics. I know how hard it is to cut recover from substance abuse um, after you've had a brain injury. And yet I've had a lot of clients who had really significant substance abuse problems, had one brain injury, and were like, that scared the devil out of them. They're done. Um, so, you know, everybody's life is different. The way that everybody goes about things is different. But you do want to always consider, I would say it's more important to consider substance abuse, if somebody has substance abuse, to consider that they might have had a brain injury. Um, same thing is that the statistics are fairly high for domestic violence. Um, of When they did a screening of 148 screened, 88 individuals or 60% of people in a domestic violence center um, have been screened positively for TBI. We do domestic violence here at uh, CFI, we have a domestic violence center, um, and I know that they have a lot of concern about hypoxic brain injury or loss of ox oxygen due to strangulation, because that's become uh, something that they're noticing more in the domestic violence world. 
Um, and there is a high, high correlation between incarceration and brain injury. So just making sure that if somebody has been incarcerated, that we're looking back at that brain injury. Another thing I wanted to talk about is just life cycle and how the age that when somebody gets their brain injury can create kind of like why the age of the brain injury makes a difference. Um, so two things that can come up. One is, is if a child has a brain injury, they may look like they've recovered really well because while they're still a child and like in elementary school, um, they are, the, somebody else is acting as their executive function. So somebody else is making sure that they're eating right or that they're doing all the right stuff. And then when they hit teenage years is when you're going to start seeing those executive, they're not going to, they're, you're not going to be able to see the executive function deficit until they need their executive function. In other words, until they're making their own decisions about how they're interacting with the world. I'm not saying altogether, like you can see some things earlier, but it's very common that you're going to start seeing the problems from a early pediatric brain injury around teenagehood when they're, that executive function needs to come on board a little bit more and it's expected to come on board and it's not. Um, the other thing that I've seen a lot of is um, people who got their brain injury when they were teenagers um, and teenagers don't have great executive function. Um, and so I may be working them when they're 50 or 60 years old, even, and you're still seeing some of those teenager like behaviors, um, which can look very different. Like it, the, if somebody acts, does certain things as a 19 year old, those same things as a 30 year old or a 50 year old can look really different to the community around them. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're just aware of that what we're looking at now might be have something to do with a brain injury that happened in the past, right? So we've talked through everything. I'm hoping that you guys can remember that your explanation should, should guide your intervention. Um, you're going to see, so make trying to learn as much as you can about the person that you've served, when they had their brain injury, how they got their brain injury, where the brain injury was, how that's affecting them. Um, and not assuming that, because uh, I'll get a lot of questions about like, uh, is this malingering or is it their brain injury? I, I, that uh, there are a couple of people who can usually figure that out. Um, a neuropsychologist can usually figure that out. Um, Mayo has a really good program that part and parcels that out, but like, that's not something that I would even know. So I'm always going to assume that the person is doing the best they can with what they have, no matter what the reason, right? Either one of those, they're doing the best they can with what they have. Um, but if you're, brain injured person seems lazy or resistant or non-compliant, all of those can be initiation problems, um, problems with executive function, um, things that have a biological component and need to be, we need to dig deep and figure out, like, okay, so let's go back to those basics and figure out how to be cut dealing with that particular situation. And knowing that can help you have the most positive attitude about how you can possibly help them. These are um, the comments that my friend Becky, so I told you back at the very beginning that I had a friend named Becky from college who had a brain injury, who made her own slideshow, which is fabulous. Um, about having a brain injury. And these are the things that she said, please don't ever say to me. Um, others have it worse than you. Going back to that slide where I'm like, let people sit with the fact that they lost something or I miss the old Becky. Um, one of the things that takes forefront here is the vegan mac macrobiotic, gluten-free, anti-inflammatory diet. Like people who are in these situations, um, are trying everything they can. And if you make, just have grace with them in the terms that they are doing the best they can and be careful about what you say. These are not my comments. This is what my friend Becky said. Please do not say any of these things to me. Um, 
And I do want to put a little plug in there for Remember the Families. I've been doing this work for a long time. Um, and being the daughter of somebody with a pretty significant brain injury, my mom had surgery this week, um, having a little rough go coming out of it. They replaced her shunt um, and she is um, struggling a little bit right now. Um, and I just want to say when you're working with someone with a brain injury and you get frustrated with their family members, you know, keep in mind that we're, we family members are doing the best we can to. And celebrate yourselves, um, celebrate your people, celebrate yourself. You guys have hung in here for um, four weeks so far, and I know you're going to attend next week and celebrate those good moments. Um, there's going to be, the, this is, this is tough work that we do. Um, I'm just hoping that you guys can take a moment and realize, um, that you dedicated yourselves to learning more, being better, doing better, uh, whether or not you got anything out of this series or not, you dedicated the time to it. And I just want to say, thank you. Thank you for how much you care. Um, what I'm always telling, um, what I've told uh, Bob the Brain, um, and so this is the saying that he and I use, is that everything will be okay in the end. If it's not the end, if it's not okay, it's not the end. Um, the, this is, I was from a movie, some people attributed to John Lennon, um, but it's something that's that it's a saying that has helped Bob the brain. I hope it remember it helps you guys. Um, it's a, it's a, it's hard, especially out there when we don't have enough people doing the work that needs to be done. Right. Like we're, we're in a huge labor crisis um, and everybody's doing the people who are doing the work are doing a whole lot with a whole little. Um, and I appreciate every single one of you for what you do. Um, remember to go next week. Um, and, um, remember to come back next, next week. Cause next week you guys get to learn from the real experts, right? Like, yeah, I, I gave you the best I got, but next week, the people who have the lived experience are going to talk. And that is better than anything I can give. Cause right. Cause life teaches you more than I will ever be able to. Um, so I did want to leave. A little bit of time this week for, let's see, do I have any other? Oh, yes. Oh, here's my information. Always open to questions. Always happy to talk to people. Um, can I send, can somebody put in the link? Mincy, Misty, can you put in the link for next week? Um, it's on two weeks. It is on two weeks. It is in very much in two weeks, not next week. And somebody has the link that is not me. It's the same link. If you guys got into this, it's going to be the same link. Um, Okay, so uh, registration list. It, it, the same link that you got into this is the same link for next week. I'm pretty sure. I'm hoping that somebody, yeah, it is because it's the same thing on the flyer, right? Like go back here. I can't print it off the flyer because it doesn't, I can't, I can't do that. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping that somebody's putting it in. Uh, let's see. Hopefully somebody can put in that. But I think if you guys can get into this, that you can get into that one. So. The, the link will go out in people's reminder emails for the next session. Okay, fabulous. All right. If you guys have any questions, um, if you, you're welcome to un unmute and say anything that you want to say. I appreciate the very sweet notes that you guys are leaving me in the chat. Um, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, and be sure to check out all the resources. Um, does anybody have any questions? We've got six minutes, or I'm going to give you the gift of time, a whole six minutes to yourselves um, to end your day. All right, let's see. All right. So we're done. I'm going to see you guys next week because I'm going to be there for, because I definitely want to watch the um, presentation that's going to happen next week with the lived experience folks. Um, as we say at the end of a yoga class, make the light and life in me, celebrate the light and life in each and every one of you. Thank you so much. May the student, and in particularly in this situation, may the student and teacher in me celebrate the student and the teacher in you. Namaste, I'm out.